am Jim Zogby, and welcome to Viewpoint. Terrorist attacks in Paris, Beirut, Iraq, Sinai, uh, all committed allegedly by ISIS uh, over a two-week period resulted in heart-wrenching loss of almost 400 people. Here in the U.S., the political fallout was swift and robust, especially after the Paris bombings. Some presidential candidates, state governors, and pundits were taking advantage of the current climate of fear and anger, calling on the U.S. to close its doors to Syrian refugees, despite the fact that the U.S. has the most stringent refugee resettlement process in the world, and we've only done, uh, brought in uh, about 1,200 uh, or 400 uh, Syrian refugees in the first place. Uh, here to discuss the developing story is Jen Smyer. She's Associate Director for Immigration and Refugee Policy with Church World Services. She's also worked uh, with Border Action Network in Tucson, Arizona, and with the Migration Policy Institute in Washington, D.C. Thanks for joining us, Jen. Thanks so much for you having know, me. You know, I, I made the point in the introduction about the very few numbers we've brought in, and you would think that, you know, you'd almost want to, uh, substitute the number of um, the undocumented that have come in with the number of Syrian refugees. I mean, it's a small number, and the president is promising a larger but still small number, and yet there's hysteria. That's right. I mean, we've only brought in now about 2,000 Syrian it's, refugees, it's 2, okay. but over the last five years, yeah. uh, which is such a minuscule number, especially compared with the global need. Um, we're looking at you know 8 million refugees from Syria, um, 4 million internally displaced people. Um, so this is a, a very, very huge humanitarian need. The president has said we'll bring in 10,000 Syrian refugees, but that's really nothing compared to what our European partners are taking in and countries in the region, literally hosting millions of refugees. You've done a lot of work there with the Syrian refugees. Um, tell us a little about what you see when you go there. The, who is leaving? Um, why are they leaving? And um, and if you could share some stories about people you've met. Well, personally, I haven't been to the region, um, but my boss, Errol Kekic, and others from Refugee Council USA went um, to Jordan, to Egypt, and they met with Syrian refugees. Um, just the other day, I was talking with Errol about one of that, those families that specifically stuck with him. Um, it was a, a mother with three very, very young children. They looked even younger because they were very malnourished, and the mother had been working um, under the table because you're not allowed to actually work in Jordan uh, as a refugee and her employer had um sexually harassed her and threatened to you know, turn her in to the authorities if she did anything about it. So she had to quit her job um, and she was on international humanitarian assistance. And she said, you know, if we go off international humanitarian assistance, I don't know what we will do. And, and this is when they were talking about cutting food rations, you know, running out of money and having to cut people off. Um, you know, her three young girls are selling candy in the street just to make ends meet. And so, I mean, people are incredibly desperate um, and I think uh, when we see you know, people who are in Syria currently internally displaced, when we see people who are in Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, uh, and who are going across the Mediterranean to seek safety, we see that desperation. And I feel like just a few short weeks ago, everyone was talking about the overwhelming support for helping Syrian refugees. Um, and I feel like that is starting to, to change right now. Yeah, the Elan Kurdi story, uh, the picture. Uh, right. I'm, was so traumatic for people. Um, even at that point, Chris Christie said, we have to be more compassionate. Mm -hmm. And now he's turned 180 degrees on that. Um, I want to talk about the European side of this uh, before we get, get here, because there was initially this sea route, and then it opened up to a land route. And the result is at least a million, right? Maybe more, and we estimate maybe a million more every year over the next three, four years. Um, the numbers are staggering, and Europe does not know how to handle it or what to do with it, but they're going to have to handle it. And the question is, uh, what is happening now? I mean, these folks just ending up sitting there in camps. Are, are new camps developing? Um, those Europeans who want to close their border uh, where do the people go? What happens um, at this point? There's nothing to go back to, and there may not be any place for them to go. What, what, what's going to occur with this? It's a great question, and I think that unfortunately a lot of that is, it remains unknown. 
Most of these European countries are signatory to the 1951 Convention on the Status of Refugees. And this is really important because they've made international commitments to take in people who are fleeing persecution. They've made international commitments to not return people back into harm's way. And now we see in the very time of need, in the very time where more people are in need of those protections, some of those countries balking at their international commitments. Um, I think that when we look at uh, the border restrictions that are being put in place in Hungary and other countries, it's very concerning because you do know that they are turning away people who have protection needs. Uh, and, and I think that that's very concerning. I think there have been a lot of questions about encampments or um, other situations in which refugees' rights would not be respected. Refugees would not have the right to work. Uh, their children wouldn't have the right to go to school. And we're going to need to see Europe find a solution to this crisis that includes refugees being able to work, being able to make livelihoods, making sure that refugee children are able to go to school so we don't have a lost generation. Mm -hmm. And you know, we saw Germany take a lead on this, saying that they could accept more than a million Syrians uh, through humanitarian admissions, refugee admissions, and asylum. Uh, and then we're seeing other countries really fail. Are there enforcement mechanisms? I mean, Hungary closed its border, and now the, so people shifted over to the west to Slovenia, and now it is saying that it's closing its border. Uh, the question is, where do they go, and is there a way to enforce this, this opening so that people aren't stranded and simply gathering in, in countries that don't want them? Well, the reality is that people are going to flee wherever they can to seek safety. And so, you know, you close off one border and they're going to find another route. And that's really what we've seen throughout. You know, refugees cannot find stability in the countries nearby, um, in the neighboring countries, and the host countries have accepted far uh, greater numbers than anyone else. And so refugees will continue to find a way. Uh, I think in terms of enforcing international law, that's always been the challenge, right? Um, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the UN Refugees, refugee agency um, is really responsible for making sure that those protocols are implemented. But it's very difficult because they are also operational partners in the region, working with those countries to keep their, their doors open, um, to have you know, resettlement schemes, to accept refugees. And so I think it's very, they're in a difficult position. This, this land route is a hike. I mean, it, there's, we're talking a thousand miles uh, with your, your babies right. and your what few belongings you're able to bring, and a lot of it on foot. Who, who cares for people under those circumstances? Are there international agencies? I mean, if they're settled in a camp in Jordan, there's a, a process there. There's, a, there's an institutionalization of, of, of the United Nations uh, distribution that can bring them food and shelter. But what happens when they're on the move like that? Is there, are any of the churches intervening? Is, is there a process to, to care for people? Well, I think we've seen grassroots responses really um, peak up across the, the region. We've seen churches, community groups. Um, th there have been just single Good Samaritans who have started to mm -hmm. uh, realize where the routes are and to try to help out um, bringing cell phone chargers, bringing food, um, helping people with basic hygiene items. But you know, when people are along that journey, uh, they really are, by and large, on their own. I mean, there are international organizations. We have a, a partner in service Serbia in particular, uh, we've been in close uh, contact with um, the uh, Church's Commission for Migrants in Europe, and I know that they've done an incredible job trying to mobilize their folks for a response. Um, but we're talking about uh, you know people who are very vulnerable. Um, many of them, you know, are, are on foot, moving uh, at their own pace, and so it it's very hard, I think, to make sure that everyone who needs services is getting them. And I think a lot of people are falling through the cracks. And what we really need are all European countries to come together to find a plan where all of these refugees will be able to be integrated into, uh, into various countries where they are. They'll be able to work, their children will be able to go to school, and there will be a long-term path to them being able to become citizens eventually. Uh, and you know, once things are, uh, when, not if, right, they are more stable in Syria, many people, I'm sure, will choose to go back. But no one should be pressured in any way to return until it's absolutely safe to do so. And unfortunately, we're seeing already some people leave Jordan, leave Turkey to go back to Syria because the conditions in camps, the conditions that they face as a refugee and having their human rights violated are just so drastic. Um, the situation here in the United States is different. There's no land route. 
Right. Um, and so there's a process uh, to bringing them into the country. Uh, they have to be vetted, and then they have to be flown over. Um, and yet, even with that, we're getting the reaction, uh, a near hysterical reaction. Uh, I'd like to, if we could, before we look at the reaction, um, if you could go through the vetting process. We have some boards that we'd put up uh, for viewers to be able to look at, but if you could talk through those boards for a bit, just to let people know how thorough the process is. I think too thorough, but nevertheless thorough. Let's take a look at that, if you could. Here's the first. Absolutely. So it's important to note, first and foremost, that the U.S. refugee resettlement program and process is the most rigorous and stringent in the world. And refugees are the most highly vetted individuals to enter the United States. So you can see, you know, refugees are fleeing um, their, their country of origin. They're going to a first country of asylum. And at some point, they will register with UNHCR. That's the UN Refugee Agency. Um, there are other referral mechanisms in terms of embassies, but basically when they encounter UNHCR in camps or in urban situations, they'll do an interview for a refugee status determination. This shows that they are refugees. They're fleeing persecution based on one of the five grounds, their race, their nationality, their religion, their political opinion, their membership in a particular social group. Um, and so UNHCR then will refer refugees to one of the 28 refugee resettlement countries. The U.S. is one of those 28. How does, how does UNHCR uh, well, how, how does the UN actually make that determination what country will send you to? Well, some of it could be based if a refugee has a family member um, in a, a certain country, then you know, family reunification is always prioritized. Um, but unfortunately, because the U.S. system is so stringent and security is what it is, um, if there are any hints of a case that might be more complicated or uh, a case where someone, for instance, didn't have documentation because they left uh, you know, as their home was being burned to the ground, those are cases that UNHCR will know are are more complicated for the United States, and so unfortunately you have many of those who are most vulnerable being resettled elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so once a refugee um, is referred, you know, in the case of the United States, that's when they usually link up with a refugee support center. And so this is an overseas processing entity where they will go through their cases, go through their files, and really put everything together that they need to apply for resettlement to the United States. So at that point, uh, the Refugee Support Center works directly with the U.S. State Department to do name checks, biographical checks, to make sure that refugees undergo all the different screenings, which include uh, biometrics, they include health screenings, and then they'll go to the Department of Homeland Security. The Department of Homeland Security officials will do an in-person interview with every single refugee. And the important part about this step of the process is every single layer of security has a different validity period. And so if the validity period expires, it has to be done all over again. So you have many refugees who have been in this process for far too long, who, you know, one family member is getting their fingerprints done, another family member's medical screening expires, another family member's, you know, interview expires, and so they have to do that interview again. So you have people who have gone through two or three interviews just because of the security check process. Um, so the Department of Homeland Security has full discretion uh, to deny someone refugee status, even if they just have an inkling that someone one might not be telling the truth, for instance. There's also forensic document screening that goes into this process and really interagency checks the entire way through. So there are consistent and constant interagency security checks. So once someone uh, starts the process, they screen their name on a constant basis so that if anything happens, they're flagged. Um, and then when they go to the United States State Department for final processing, that's when we would work with the International Organization for Migration. They get a travel alone so they can come to the United States and then they go through a final medical screening and screening with the National Counterterrorism um, Center and the FBI. So every single layer of domestic and international security in terms of the United States uh, is involved in this process. So uh, like I said, they'll go through a final medical screening and then they'll arrange travel to the United States. At that point, they uh, really a week before they arrive uh, or, or longer, they will link up with a refugee resettlement organization like Church World Service 
Service. We're one of the nine refugee resettlement organizations in the U.S. And then we will look at their case, see if they have family in a certain state, see which state would be best for them to be resettled in, uh, and allocate those cases to our local offices across the country. So do, I think we have a picture of the states that have said no, where governors have said no. Can we get that up if, if, uh, if we've got it? Because we've had um, 31 governors say they won't accept. Um, do they have a say in that process? Or so, if they, if, if ex refugees coming over here and has family in Louisiana, is it Bobby Jindal be damned? Uh, he's going there anyway, or can the governor overrule uh, a, a settlement process? So governors do not have a say in whether refugees can come to their states. The federal government runs refugee resettlement and specifically uh, determines where refugees can, can be placed. So governors can ask uh, the State Department not to resettle refugees in their states, um, but it is a federal program, just like all of our immigration policies are federal. However, I think specifically these governors are asking for the State Department to not resettle Syrian refugees, and that brings up a whole host of discrimination issues. Certainly states cannot choose whether someone can come to their, their state based on nationality. That's in clear violation of everything our country stands for and discrimination uh, laws. Um, so right now we're at this moment where these governors have said, we don't want to take in Syrian refugees. I think that the U.S. State Department's going to have to respond to that. Um, I think that in many of these cases, these governors are citing um, misinformation. It's clear that they don't understand the security process uh, and how rigorous it is. But we need to stand strong and make sure that the U.S. State Department does not acquiesce to racism being part mm -hmm. of our, uh, our refugee resettlement system. Or Jeb Bush and Ted Cruz saying Christians, not Muslims, it simply can't be done. It absolutely cannot be done. I mean, the U.S. would have to basically reverse every single anti-discrimination law on the books. Uh, and it really, it, it's not just legally, uh, it's also morally what is right. I mean, you're seeing these governors, these political candidates who are, uh, it's amazing to me that these words are even coming out of their mouths because it is so counter to everything that we stand for in this country. Mm -hmm. You cannot have a religious litmus test on if someone's life matters enough to be rescued, if someone has access to humanitarian relief. I look at a couple of things that have been said um, for a sort of fact check, if you could. Here, here was Ben Carson saying, we don't know who they are. Um, the majority of them are young males. They could easily be people who could be infiltrated by terrorists. Well, number one, according to the vetting process, we do know who they are. We absolutely know who they are. And, you know, this is coming from, there was this one um, FBI uh, personnel who said, you know, we don't have a database as rigorous as we have for Iraq and Afghanistan. Well, the reason that we have a very, very robust database for refugees from Iraq and Afghanistan is because we've been occupying their countries and involved in military warfare there for quite some time. It shouldn't take going to war with those countries to get the data that we need for refugee resettlement. And here's the UNHCR data about the refugees. 50 plus percent are women, 6.5 percent are males, 15 to 17, 51 percent under 17, um, and 38.5 of whom are under 12. That's I mean, right. obviously, we're not talking about young males seeking to do harm, but we're talking about a largely female and very young population. Absolutely. Uh, let, let's look at another one. That was uh, Mike Huckabee. He says, tens of thousands of unvetted people from the Middle East coming here. Um, and then we have a rebuttal from Ann Richard, um, the Assistant Secretary of State. They're the most highly scrutinized and vetted groups of people. Um, and when you look at the candidates for president, uh, these were two of them, uh, and the governors, the statements, I, a, a lot of it is focused on the president himself. I mean, Don, Donald Trump saying, I just don't trust the president to do it, or uh, one of the candidates saying the president has to be crazy to do this. I mean, language that, that makes it clear to me that something else is going on here other than a rational response to this process. David Vitter who's running for um, a, a governor in Louisiana and who's losing because of his rather shady past, um, has a TV ad that's airing where he refers to his opponent as a 
uh, refugee hugging supporter of the president, um, talking about the dangers of Syrian refugees coming in a way to sort of tarnish his candidate, his, uh, his opponent with that. Um, it's a disgraceful um, sort of baiting of a very vulnerable and, and injured people. It absolutely is. And you'd think that we would learn from our history. You know, um, you know we have returned um, Jews during the Holocaust back to Germany, turning ships back around. We have put Japanese Americans in internment camps. And when we look back at those moments in our history, we are ashamed as well we should be. And now we're talking about basically doing the same exact thing to Syrian refugees. And I'm not sure if these governors and, and candidates haven't read a history book recently. Um, or haven't read the U.S. Constitution or anything about what we stand for. Um, but it's absolutely un-American. It's absolutely immoral. Um, and it, it, it's political. It's politicizing people's lives. Uh, you know, in 1980, we airlifted 200,000 Vietnamese and Indochinese uh, after the fall of Saigon. And it wasn't politically popular. We had an economic recession at the time. And uh, Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter decided that they were going to take moral leadership. And I think that's what this president is doing. The numbers we're talking about, total refugee numbers are 85,000 a year, nowhere near the 200,000 that we were talking about throughout the 1980s. Um, so unfortunately, we're seeing the politicization uh, of, of refugees' lives, and it's just unacceptable. And the 85,000 are from all over the world. That's right. And the president has said that of that, 10 will be Syrian. That's right. So the numbers are not Donald Trump's 200,000. No, absolutely not. I, I will say, though, that uh, we have been asking uh, Church World Service, as well as our partners yeah. in Refugee Council USA, for that number to be 200,000, yeah. because we believe that there should be 100,000 Syrians resettled this year, in addition to 100,000 refugees from all over the world. And is the process, the vetting process, such that you could do 100,000? Absolutely. Where there's a will, there's a way. And, you know, we look at the small, small amount of funding that goes uh, to the refugee program. In fact, refugee screening processes are fully fee funded. So no taxpayer's money is, is going to that process in particular. And uh, that is a process that we fee could funded scale by up whom? by other immigrant applications. So uh, other immigrants, when they apply for, uh, for their application, part of their uh, fee for that will go to uh, the security checks for refugees. Um, so you know, we could bolster our humanitarian assistance in the region. We could bolster our refugee resettlement process uh, here in the United States. We could bolster that screening process easily uh, at a fraction of the cost uh, that we've seen you know, Department of Homeland Security immigration enforcement measures go up to do. President Obama has doubled down. Um, he's not buckling on this. Let's take, there's a quote we have from the president on this, and it's pretty strong. Slamming the door in the face of refugees um, is, would betray our deepest values. That's not who we are, and that's not what we're going to do. He's been tough on it, and can he win the day? Absolutely, because honestly, the American people are with the president on this. We have people across the country, hundreds of thousands of people, who are volunteering for refugee resettlement organizations, teaching English as a second language, helping refugees get their first job, learn the bus system. I mean, we the heart and soul of this country includes people who are refugees themselves and communities that are welcoming refugees. And I think that's what we're starting to see now are more of those voices getting through um, after the hyperbole that's happened uh, in an anti-Syrian res resettlement way. Your organization convened a press conference of faith leaders. Um, how important can the faith leaders be? Or are they voices that are going to be sort of speaking into the wind and, and ignored by political leadership? I feel like faith leaders' voices are incredibly important here because we're talking about the very soul of our country. And we're talking about proposals of only bringing in Christians or proposals of not bringing in individuals from Syria, Iraq, or the region. Uh, we're talking about racism. We're talking about demagoguery. We're talking about the soul of this country. So I feel like when faith leaders can speak to that, members of Congress will listen. And I would hope and pray that um, you know, members of Congress are listening to their conscience on this and are hearing those faith leaders' voices. I was thinking that to the same degree that Muslims are troubled when they hear ISIS use their religion. How troubling I personally find it when I hear Christians 
um, speaking in a bigoted way about bringing foreigners uh, to this country. It, and, and I see these groups, the Christian Coalition for something or other, and saying keep the Muslims out. It's, it's distressing, and yet that's where the discourse has gone. It is, although I will say, in a ray of hope, the National Association of Evangelicals, we're Church World Service, a coalition of uh, 37 different Protestant denominations. We are seeing you know, Jews and Muslims and Catholics and Protestants really join hand in hand here. And all of the national religious denominations, all of the national religious leaders have really come out to say, this isn't who we are. We need to fully accept and welcome Syrian refugees. If people want to get involved, and help out, what can they do? So there are many different ways. I would encourage people to go to the Church World Service website, which is cwsglobal.org. People can also go to Refugee Council USA's website, rcusa.org. Uh, find your local refugee resettlement office near you. I guarantee there's one near every single person who's watching today. And, uh, and find a way to volunteer. You can donate money to any of the refugee resettlement organizations, the humanitarian organizations internationally. Call your member of Congress. Make sure your member of Congress knows that you want to welcome Syrian refugees. Call your governors, especially if they're one of those 31, but even if they're not, make sure that your governors, your local members uh, of the state legislature know that you want to welcome Syrian refugees. This is critical and every single voice matters. Thank you so much. That's all the time we've got. Listen, go to my website. It's aaiusa.org. We have some the same resources here about the vetting process, but also resources about rebutting some of the false claims that have been made. This is a critical issue and it's going to be with us for quite a while. Uh, to, to some extent, I mean, one can almost be in a perverse way thankful that the bigots have had their, their, their say because it gives people of goodwill an opportunity to respond and to elevate the debate in a different way. So go to the website, AAI USA, or go to uh, Church World Service, CS. Uh, CWS Global um, and check out the resources that are available. Uh, that's all the time we've got and thanks for watching and I'll see you next week on Viewpoint. Mm -hmm.